The purpose of this talk is to give you a good overview of some of the most important radiology related information that you need to know as a generalist on call, whether you be in internal medicine, emergency medicine, hospitalist, whatever. Now, in general, we're going to focus on the practical things that you need to know as a generalist on call, and we're not going to focus too much on imaging interpretation. In other words, we're going to focus on the things that you need to know as a generalist and not the things that we need to know as radiologists. With that being said, when it comes to the types of studies that you're going to order and look at on call, we can split it into plain films and everything else, which includes CT scans, MRIs, and ultrasounds. When it comes to plain films at most centers in Canada, plain films are not reported overnight by radiology. So I encourage you to get comfortable with mainly chest and abdominal plain films. Oftentimes, you're going to look at these and come to management changing decisions based on your interpretation. I should mention that if you have any questions regarding a plain film on call, the radiology resident or someone in the radiology department on call will be happy to help you if you need it. Getting into imaging interpretation and talking about plain films is beyond the scope of today's talk, and I encourage you to check out some of the other resources on navigatingradiology.com to learn about this more. When it comes to everything else like CTs, MRIs, and ultrasounds, they're generally reported overnight by the radiology team, so you don't need to know too, too much with respect to interpreting these types of images. Now, I do think that it is important to understand just the very bare-bones basics of CT to put everything else into context. It's one of the most common things you order, and sometimes you're going to look at scans prior to radiology taking a look at the scan. So, basic principles of CT. First things first, this is not a CT, this is an x-ray. And very simply, the things that are more dense are going to show up as brighter on the film, and the things that are less dense are going to show up as darker on the film. This is an axial slice of a CT scan. This is the right side of the patient, this is the left side of the patient, this is the back of the patient, and this is the front of the patient. And the same principle applies. Things that are less dense show up as darker, and things that are more dense show up as brighter. Now how dense a particular tissue is can be measured on the scale that represents its density. And the scale we use in CT is called the Hounsfield unit scale. So the basic radiographic densities are important. If you understand this slide and know the relationships between the tissues, everything else in CT becomes easy. The Hounsfield unit number is not so important. Instead, what's more important is the relationship between the tissues and the principles. Obviously, gas, is going to be very low density and show up as darker. And things like bone and metal are very, very dense and they're going to show up as very bright. In between, know that fat is less dense than water. If you mix oil and water, oil floats because it's less dense. Soft tissues are slightly more dense than water. And probably the most important point on this slide for this particular talk is that acutely clotted blood is going to show up as slightly brighter than most soft tissues and water on a non-contrast scan. So in this talk, we're going to focus on some of the most commonly encountered pathologies that you might see on call and require imaging overnight. And we're going to organize this talk based on modality, starting with neuroradiology, then chest, and then abdominal radiology. Now, there's a decent amount of content here, and I want to make sure that you guys know not to focus too much on the details. Instead, focus on the overarching concepts so you know what to do in different situations. I should mention again that the radiologist on call acts as a consultant on all things radiology. That means that if you have any questions regarding what test to order next or whatever, you should consult us. If you find yourself debating with your staff wondering whether CT, MRI, ultrasound, stop, pick up the phone and call the radiologist and we can come to a decision together. So let's start with neuroradiology. Case 1. A nurse calls you from the floor and says, I have a 72-year-old female here with AFib, seen well two hours ago, and now has right-sided weakness and aphasia. You assess the patient, confirm the findings. So what's your next step? So this is a critical point. If you suspect a hyperacute stroke that is potentially in the window for treatment, you need to call a code stroke. Calling a code stroke in Toronto is going to set off a chain of events. So at most sites, the CT techs, the radiologists, and the neurology team will all be notified automatically. And based on the timing of the symptoms, the severity of the symptoms based on the NIHSS score, and the patient's imaging, 
a decision is going to be made as to what the next best step is with respect to treatment. So you activate the code stroke protocol for this patient and the patient goes down to be imaged. Now what's the next step with respect to imaging our patient? When it comes to imaging and stroke, we have a number of imaging options. Four of the most commonly used are plain CT head, CTA, CT perfusion, and MRI. Even in Toronto, the stroke protocol is going to vary from institution to institution and is often guided by the stroke neurologist. As you know, time is brain. Regardless of what set you're at, you're always, always, always going to start with a non-contrast CT scan. At many of the stroke centers in Toronto, like Sunnybrook and St. Mike's, a quote-unquote stroke protocol routinely involves a non-contrast CT scan, a CTA, and a CT perfusion scan. MRI is rarely performed in the acute setting in Canada to determine treatment. But regardless of these details, the most important thing to take away from this slide is that we're going to start with a non-contrast CT scan to start. Okay, And when we're imaging in code stroke, what are we trying to figure out? The way I like to think about it is I like to split it up into four big questions. Big question number one is, is there hemorrhage? Because if there's hemorrhage, we're going to manage it obviously very differently. Big question number two, is there evidence of acute ischemic stroke? Remember, stroke is a clinical diagnosis, but sometimes when the stroke neurologists are on the fence, they're not sure about the clinical findings, imaging can help with the treatment decision. The next big question that it helps us answer is, is there a proximal thrombus that is amenable to retrieval? At most sites, this is generally reserved for proximal MCA and basilar artery occlusions. Now, lastly, we want to help the neurologist by giving an idea as to how much tissue is irreversibly infarcted and how much is salvageable. So, as we mentioned, we're always going to start with a non-contrast CT scan, but what does the non-contrast CT scan help us with? Well, it's really, really, really good at helping us answer big question one. Is there hemorrhage? So this is an example of a plain CT head. This is the right side, the left side, the front, and the back. And remember, acutely clotted blood is bright. This is an acute intracerebral hemorrhage with extension into the left lateral ventricle. And obviously, this is going to change the patient's management. It also helps us answer big question two. We can assess for signs of ischemic stroke. But again, remember, stroke is a clinical diagnosis and the non-contrast CT scan is often completely normal in the setting of hyperacute or acute stroke. So earlier I mentioned that we're not going to focus too much on imaging signs. However, you're going to be involved in code stroke situations and I think it's important to know some of the basic signs of acute stroke on plain CT head. Now, as a generalist, there are really only two things that you need to know with respect to signs on CT head. And the first is a hyperdense artery sign or a hyperdense vessel sign. Remember, acutely clotted blood is going to show up as bright. In acute stroke, you have an acute clot inside the vessel, so that vessel is going to show up as bright. So this is an example of a left MCA acute clot. The second thing that you need to look for is loss of gray-white differentiation. In a normal brain, the gray matter is slightly denser than the white matter. So when there's acute ischemic stroke, the cells themselves don't get blood. As a result, they can't make ATP. The sodium-potassium ATPase pump stops working. And as a result, the cells themselves swell up or there is cytotoxic edema. Remember, water is less dense than soft tissue in the brain, so cytotoxic edema makes the gray matter look less dense. As a result, the gray matter looks darker and looks similar to the white matter and you lose the differentiation between the gray and the white matter, aka you lose gray-white differentiation. In this example here, this is obviously a different patient. We have loss of gray-white differentiation in the right side of the brain. This is the putamen on the left, this is the caudate, and this is called the insular ribbon. Early in a proximal MCA occlusion, you will start to lose gray-white differentiation in the basal ganglia like you have here in the caudate and the putamen and also in the insular ribbon here. So the next thing that we generally do in a stroke protocol is a CTA. And again, a CTA is going to help us answer big question two and looking for signs of acute stroke. If you follow the vessels and see an abrupt occlusion, 
That suggests an acute occlusion in the setting of stroke. Also, CTA is going to help us answer big question three very well, and that is, is there an acute clot that is proximal enough that neurointerventional procedures might benefit the patient? So this is an example of a coronal slice. This is the right side of the patient. This is the left side of the patient. This is the right internal carotid artery. This is the right anterior cerebral artery, or ACA. And this is the right MCA here. On the left side, we have the ACA and part of the MCA, and it is occluded uh, right here. Next, we often do CT perfusion, which also helps us answer big question two to see if there are signs of acute ischemic stroke namely we're looking for a perfusion defect and it's going to help us answer big question number four is the affected tissue irreversibly infarcted or is there salvageable tissue that would benefit from treatment now you don't really need to know any details about CT perfusion how it's acquired etc but if you're going to take one thing away from this slide it's to know that the main reason why we do it is to answer big question four of the tissue that is affected how much of it is irreversibly infarcted, and how much of it is still salvageable if we were to intervene. So, back to our case. Let's answer big question number one. Is there hemorrhage? And the answer is no. Big question number two. Are there signs of acute ischemic stroke? Yes, there's a left dense MCA sign, and there might be a little bit of loss of gray-white, but there's no obvious uh, loss of gray-white differentiation. Also, there is an occlusion of the MCA on the CTA. Big question number three, is this amenable to neurointerventional procedure? And the answer is yes. This is a proximal left MCA occlusion. And big question number four, irreversible or salvageable tissue. The CT perfusion would help us with. However, I should note that there is no loss of gray-white differentiation at this point, or very little. Had there been, had there been an established infarct, we would see that as loss of gray-white differentiation on our plain CT head. So patient went for angio and the clot was retrieved. Patient only has residual weakness and there's a small infarct here in the posterior operculum. But in general, the entire MCA territory that was susceptible tissue uh, has been salvaged. So you saved about half this patient's brain by calling a code stroke. So case two, you have a medical student who does a consult comes to you and tells you that the patient presents with a fever, headache, their jolt accentuation is positive, and he swears he did the Koenigs and Brzezinski sign, and they were negative. So, obviously in this situation, we're worried about meningitis. So, what is the purpose of imaging in meningitis? Although it is true that there are imaging signs of meningitis, especially on MRI, the goal of imaging is not to diagnose the meningitis. The diagnosis should be made based on the clinical picture and an LP. The main goal of imaging in the acute setting is to rule out increased ICP. Things like brain masses, herniation, etc. that allow us to move on safely with an LP. So then we can ask ourselves, when do we need a CT to rule this stuff out and when do we not? I should mention that CT head prior to LP is a controversial topic. The general consensus, as far as I understand it at present, is that a CT head is only required in certain scenarios. For example, if the patient has focal neurologic deficits, seizures, decreased LOC, etc., or if the patient has hard findings of increased ICP, like papilledema. Now, there is some variability with clinicians. Some people like to order CTs on most patients that they do LPs on. Others believe that the CT head is pointless as there is some research to suggest that the imaging findings don't actually predict who's going to herniate when you actually do an LP. But if I was the clinician, I would probably stick to this list. Next case, case three. So the nurse pages you again, the same one that paged you earlier and says, Dr. Doctor, Mr. Smith climbed out of bed, hit his head on the floor, and now he has a bad headache and some nausea and vomiting. So what's the next appropriate step in imaging? So you guys deal with this all the time when it comes to looking for acute traumatic hemorrhage, which is going to show up as bright, a non-contrast CT head is going to be sufficient. So as I just mentioned, acutely clotted blood is going to show up as bright. The point I want to make on this slide is that as blood progresses to subacute and then chronic blood, the density is going to decrease over time. Eventually when it's chronic, it's going to approach CSF density. 
So that means that at some point between being acute and chronic in the subacute phase, it's gonna, the blood is going to be a similar density to the brain and be harder to detect. So this is our patient's CT head acutely after falling. Okay, and so obviously here there is a left convexity, acute subdural hematoma. There's also a small right subdural collection here. Remember, subdural hematomas cross the suture lines and they're crescenteric in shape. Now, we image the patient later on, let's say a couple weeks after, and this is the CT head that comes up. Now, what do you see on this CT head? And again, you can pause it if you need to. So on this CT, we have subacute subdurals bilaterally. So the left one, which is more conspicuous, you can see here. Again, as I mentioned, it's a similar density to the brain, making it harder to pick up. We have a subdural here, and we also have one here as well. So make sure you don't miss these. They can be easy to miss, given their similar density to the brain. So last neuro case is case four. So we have a 67-year-old female who has metastatic breast cancer and presents with back pain and new leg weakness. So what is the test of choice in this situation and where are you going to image? So we have new neurologic symptoms and we have a patient who has a history of cancer. The best test, the best test in this situation is an MRI. CT can look for bony mets, yes, but if you're worried about core compression, MRI is the best test to do. So the next question is where do we image? Now the, the clinical exam often helps direct imaging in the spine. However, when you're dealing with cord compression from metastatic disease, we generally image the entire spine. I've seen very, very, I've seen very, very many cases where the team is worried about cord compression from metastatic disease and is convinced that it's in the lumbar spine and it ends up being higher up or lower than they expected or whatever. So when it comes to metastatic disease, we generally image the entire spine, that's the C, T, and L spine, using the cord compression protocol. So this is our patient here. This is the front of the patient. This is the back of the patient. These are obviously the vertebral bodies and discs. These are the spinous processes, and this is the spinal canal. So we don't need to know anything about MRI at this point, except for that these are T2-weighted images, and we know that because the CSF is bright. So CSF and fluid is bright on T2-weighted images. Again, don't focus on the details here, but an important principle is that when you're looking at these images, and you're looking for core compression, look at the CSF around the cord and see if it's effaced or not. So over here we have good CSF on both sides of the cord so it's obviously not compressed. But as we move up the spine, we notice that we lose the CSF space around the cord here and we're highly suspicious for it being compressed. When we look at the axial images, this is a normal level. Again, the same principle applies. This is a T2-weighted image and you see CSF all the way around the cord. Now if we go to the level in question here, you'll notice that we don't see any CSF around the cord. We have these epidural deposits that are metastatic deposits that are compressing the cord quite significantly. Okay, a quick word on cauda equina. Ruling out cauda equina is one of the very few indications for urgent MRI overnight. I should mention that cauda equina presents with acute symptoms and it's an indication for emergent surgical management. So if someone has long-standing incontinence it's not necessarily an indication for MRI emergently overnight. And again, cauda equina syndrome is a clinical diagnosis that can be confirmed by radiologic testing. Okay, next we talk about chest imaging. Okay, so case one. You get a consult from Emerge and they tell you that it's a 65-year-old guy who has tearing chest pain radiating to his back. Also, they mention that his mediastinum is widened on chest x-ray and they think that it's a dissection potentially. So let's use this opportunity to talk about chest x-ray in the setting of aortic dissection. Now everyone talks about widened mediastinum in the setting of aortic dissection and it is true that in about 60% of patients with dissection you're going to see a widened mediastinum. However, there are a lot of other causes of widened mediastinum like mediastinal masses, aneurysms, lymphadenopathy, etc. that are more common so you should know that it's not really a specific sign by any means. Also, a chest x-ray is normal in about 20% of patients who have an aortic dissection. Okay, So the main purpose of doing a chest x-ray in the setting of suspected dissection is to rule out other causes of symptoms. So the details don't matter here. What you need to take away is this. 
a chest x-ray is not sensitive enough to rule out dissection, and a chest x-ray is not specific enough to rule in dissection. If your clinical suspicion for dissection is high enough, you're going to need to proceed with a CTA to rule it in or rule it out, of course. Now, as you probably already know, a CTA of the chest and the abdomen is the gold standard for diagnosing dissection. On imaging, you're looking for a dissection flap, and you see that here. So this is a coronal image, this is the heart, this is the aorta, or the aortic arch here, and you see a branch of the aortic arch here. This here is a dissection flap with the true and false lumen above and below it. This is a coronal image as well. This is the descending aorta here, and you see a dissection flap right here with the true lumen and the false lumen. So, while we're on the topic of dissections, I want to briefly introduce a concept here that I feel is very poorly understood, and that is the concept of the term acute aortic syndrome. So acute aortic syndrome is a term most commonly used to describe three closely related entities, that is aortic dissection, acute intramural hematoma, and penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Now, the words acute aortic syndrome actually refers to the clinical syndrome or clinical presentation that is most often associated with aortic dissection, so things like tearing chest pain, radiating to the back, whatever. Now, a detailed discussion of each of these conditions is beyond the scope of this talk, but you should take away the following. All three involve blood in the aortic wall. All three clinically present very similarly, i.e. with acute aortic syndrome and all three are managed very similarly. So obviously it's very important to be aware of these terms. If a radiologist reports an acute intramural hematoma or a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer, it's important to know the gravity of what this represents. Let's quickly focus on the two most common, aortic dissection and intramural hematoma. So an aortic dissection, as you guys know, involves a tear in the intima, blood dissecting behind the tear, you get an intimal flap that separates the true and false lumen. And the point here is that the true and false lumen communicate, and oftentimes, in most situations, you're going to get contrast on both sides of the dissection flap, in the true and the false lumens. Now, an intramural hematoma simply refers to exactly that. It's an intramural hematoma. It's acute blood in the wall of the aorta. This is obviously much different than an aortic dissection, there's no communication between this hematoma and the lumen. You just have acute blood in the vessel wall. The theory of the pathophysiology is that this is caused by rupture of the vasovisorum in the vessel wall. And remember, acutely clotted blood is bright, so it's going to show up on a non-contrast scan as being bright, as in this example here. This is an acute intramural hematoma. So, to diagnose an acute intramural hematoma, you need a non-contrast scan. This is one of the main reasons why we do a non-contrast CT scan prior to giving contrast in a rule-out dissection protocol. Now, as I mentioned earlier, regardless, all three of these diagnoses are managed very similarly. They can be divided into type A and type B based on the Sanford classification. Type A involves the aorta proximal to left subclavian and is generally managed surgically, and type B involves only distal to the left subclavian and is generally managed medically. To make it even simpler, if the dissection or pathology involves anything proximal to the left subclavian, if anything proximal to the left subclavian is involved, it's type A. If not, it's type B. Very briefly, the goal of the CT is not only to diagnose a dissection or intramural hematoma or whatever, but it's also to assess for complications. If the dissection involves a branched vessel, it can result in end organ ischemia. For example, if it involves the SMA, you can get bowel ischemia. If it dissects back into the coronary arteries, you can, get a, you can get an MI, which is obviously a very dreaded complication of a type A dissection. Another dreaded complication is rupture into the pericardial sac that results in hemopericardium and potentially eventually tamponade. So, case two, we're going to talk about pulmonary emboli. In my opinion, routine imaging in suspected pulmonary emboli is generally well understood by most residents, so we're not going to focus too much time here. As you know, there are signs uh, for PE on x-ray, things like Hampton's hump, Westermark sign, Fleischner's sign, but in general, chest x-rays are performed to rule out other pathology. 
You guys know the Wells criteria and use it frequently. It's used to risk stratify. And as you know, in patients who have a low or moderate probability of PE, if you have a negative D-dimer, you essentially rule out a PE. The gold standard for diagnosing a PE is a CTPA study, which uses contrast. Basically, the principle is that you inject contrast in the patient's veins, it goes back to the heart, the right heart pumps the contrast into the lungs, and when it's in the pulmonary arterial system, we image. The main principle is that we're looking for filling defects, as we're showing here. So on the right here, we have a saddle embolism here in the main pulmonary artery. And on the right here, we have a more distal uh, segmental pulmonary embolism. So let's discuss some few commonly asked questions. What happens if your patient can't receive contrast? Well, if the pretest probability is high enough, for example, they have a very high Wells score, you can consider empiric anticoagulation. If the patient has any leg symptoms, you can start with leg Dopplers. You can also do a VQ scan. VQ scans are most accurate in patients who have normal baseline lung function, and they're often not available overnight. Now, very common question, what if your patient's pregnant? So, first we talk about D-dimer in pregnancy. Most people seem to completely write off D-dimers in pregnancy, knowing that they are often falsely elevated and you often can get false positive rates. And yes, it is true that the D-dimer is going to be higher in the setting of pregnancy. However, if you do have a negative D-dimer in pregnancy, it still effectively rules out PE, and you can completely avoid the conundrum of how you're going to image that patient. So it can be worth it in certain situations. On top of this, there are pregnancy-specific reference ranges that can be employed to help improve the utility of D-dimer in pregnancy. So if we have to go ahead and image the patient anyways, there are alternatives to CTPA in pregnant patients. If the patient has leg symptoms, we can start with a leg ultrasound to assess for DVT. We can do a VQ scan or a ventilation perfusion scan. I should mention that when this is done, the perfusion part or the Q part is done first. And if the Q part is normal, we can effectively rule out PE and limit the radiation dose by not moving on to the ventilation portion. You can also do a low-dose CTPA. So a common question is, what is the radiation risk of a CTPA and a VQ scan in pregnancy? So when it actually comes to the fetus itself, the risk to the fetus is not that much different between a CTPA and a Q-only scan. Actually, a CTPA has a lower radiation dose than a full VQ scan when it comes to radiation dose to the fetus. So, then why do we avoid CTPA in pregnancy? The main reason is the risk to the mother. So, the dose of radiation by CTPA to the pregnant breast is much, much, much higher than a VQ scan. and The pregnant breast is more susceptible to radiation effect and puts the patient at a potentially higher risk for breast cancer. As an aside, I should mention that when it comes to IV contrast, there's no proven risk to the fetus. So current guidelines in pregnancy, if you're suspecting a PE in pregnancy, check whether or not they have leg symptoms. If they have leg symptoms, start with a Doppler and try to find a DVT. If not, or if that's negative, move ahead with a chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is normal, you can move ahead with a VQ scan and limit the radiation dose to the patient's breasts. If the, if the chest x-ray is abnormal, the VQ scan is often less useful, so we need to move ahead with a CTPA. So, case three, you have a patient with cough, shortness of breath, and fever. And you do an x-ray and you see that the patient has a large right pleural effusion. A quick few words on pleural effusion. They're best seen on x-ray on upright films where we see blunting of the costophrenic angles and fluid moving dependently. A lateral film is more sensitive than a PA film, and the numbers are there for how much fluid is required to be detected on those views. If you're concerned about loculation of fluid, you can perform a decubitus view. What that means is that you turn the patient on the side and see if the fluid layers dependently or stays where it is. You can consider a CT with contrast if a chest tube is indicated, for example, if you suspect an empyema or whatever. Remember, diagnosing empyema, complicated paranormonic effusion, whatever, is based on thoracentesis and not imaging. So, we have our patient's chest x-ray here. We're concerned about loculation. We do a decubitus view. And if the fluid was not loculated and it was free-flowing, 
it would layer dependently like this. Instead, it doesn't change because this is loculated fluid. We do a CT, and this is what we see. This is an example of an empyema, again, diagnosed with thoracentesis. The sign I'm trying to show here is that this is loculated fluid that is in the pleural space here, okay? And there's thickening and enhancing of the visceral pleura here, as well as the parietal pleura. That's called the split pleura sign, and it's commonly seen in the setting of empyema. Okay, so I mentioned contrast. A common question that I get asked when I'm on call is whether or not we should give contrast for a patient with a CT chest. So this table summarizes some of the most common diagnoses and common indications for a CT scan and whether or not we need IV contrast. To simplify it, the takeaway point is this. If you're assessing the lungs or for lung disease, things like pneumonia, heart failure, interstitial lung disease, you don't generally need contrast. If you're assessing something vascular, of course you're going to need contrast. And when you're assessing something where enhancement is going to help you, like an empyema, an abscess, or a tumor, we're going to give IV contrast. I should mention for a routine staging scan, we generally give contrast for this reason, as well as to delineate the mediastinal structures better. The last section is the abdominal imaging section. And the study that you're probably going to order the most on call and interpret the most on your own is the abdominal x-ray. So I think it's important to understand the utility of the abdominal x-ray. Abdominal x-rays are useful to diagnose free air in the setting of a perforation, for example. Remember, free air rises. So in order to see free air under the diaphragm, the patient's going to have to be upright. It also can help in the setting of obstruction, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. For most other things, we generally go straight to CT. Now, there are obviously many different signs that can indicate different types of pathology, but we generally don't order abdominal x-rays for those things. Now, probably the most important point I'm going to make in this entire talk is that constipation is a clinical diagnosis. Okay, It is true that you can see stool in the large bowel on x-ray, obviously, but that's what the colon's for. It's there to store stool. There are actual grading systems that have been developed, full research papers that discuss these grading systems, and they look at the distribution of stool in the colon to classify the constipation as mild, moderate, or severe. But inter-observer reliability is poor, which means that different radiologists say different things about the same poo. And in general, studies have shown that abdominal x-rays are pretty poor and have a limited value in diagnosing constipation. So the main point here of this slide is that the utility of the abdominal x-ray is generally limited to very few indications. So let's take that one step further and look at the sensitivity of the abdominal x-ray in these particular situations. So the main points here are the following. Upright x-rays are pretty sensitive for diagnosing free air in the setting of perforation, okay? but they're not 100% sensitive. The second main point is that in the setting of obstruction, plain abdominal x-rays are actually not that sensitive. It is true that there are specific signs of obstruction, but in general, if you have non-specific gas pattern or a gaseous abdomen, it's very difficult to actually rule out obstruction. So CT abdo without any contrast is generally reserved for a very few select indications, most commonly for stones. In general, it's a good idea to speak to radiology before ordering a non-contrast CT. The reason is because if there's anything beyond just a simple stone, it's often good to have contrast on board to evaluate everything else uh, much more adequately. A non-contrast CT scan can also be used for things like retroperitoneal hematoma, rupture AAA, etc. So then we have everything else and we can utilize IV, oral, and rectal contrast. When it comes to these other things, the study is generally going to be protocoled by radiology, so you don't need to know too much about when you should use each of these things. What you do need to know is that IV contrast is injected into the veins, there's PO or oral contrast that is given through the mouth, and there's PR contrast or rectal contrast that is given through the back passage. A quick side note that I do want to mention because I've been asked this multiple times on call is whether or not you can give oral contrast in the situation where a patient has an IV contrast allergy. I should mention that oral contrast can generally 
be given to these patients in the vast majority of situations. However, I do need to mention that there is a theoretical risk of a cross-reaction. Oral contrast is a dilute iodinated contrast and it does get absorbed to a small degree. So reaction to PO contrast can occur but it is excessively rare. The current guidelines are generally that you can give oral contrast in all situations except for when the patient has a previous anaphylactic reaction to IV contrast. In those situations, you should avoid oral contrast until the patient is premedicated as they would be for their IV contrast scan. Next, we talk about abdominal ultrasounds. So when it comes to ordering abdominal ultrasounds, it's very important to specify the part of the body that you're worried about most and give a good history. So for example, a good history might be right upper quadrant pain, rule out cholecystitis, look for CBD stones. A bad history in the same situation might be epigastric pain, rule out pathology. The reason why it's specifically more important to have a good history when we're talking about abdominal ultrasounds is because abdominal ultrasound is operator dependent. And a general abdominal ultrasound is just a screening examination of all of the organs in the abdomen. And if they know the area of concern or what's specifically being looked for, more time can be spent on that area. And there's a higher chance of giving you a more helpful answer to your question. So again, if you're going to give a good history on any test, it's an ultrasound. And when do we use ultrasound? Well, ultrasound is better than CT for gallstones. It has a greater than 90% sensitivity. It's good at assessing, assessing the biliary tree. The gynecologic organs are notoriously poorly assessed for on CT, and ultrasound is, of course, much better. And there are other things, of course, like IR guided procedures or anything that involves assessing vascular flow or Doppler examination. Now, when it comes to biliary pathology, it's a little bit more complex. Ultrasound should be first line if you're assessing for cholecystitis, dilatation of the biliary tract, or cholelithiasis. With that being said, some papers suggest that CT is actually more sensitive for cholidocolithiasis, i.e. stones in the actual CBD itself. Also, you should consider CT when assessing for complicated gallbladder disease, so if you're worried about complication, abscess, gangrenous cholecystitis, etc. Quick word about ascending cholangitis. It's important to remember that ascending cholangitis is a clinical diagnosis, however, Imaging can help in the following ways. It can help by demonstrating a biliary obstruction, you can visualize the duct dilatation, and there are a few findings that can suggest cholangitis in the right clinical setting, namely thicken and enhancing bile ducts, heterogeneous enhancement of the liver, etc. <clears throat> Remember, the specific imaging findings are not important for you at this point, and just focus on the overarching principle. So, case one, we have a 25-year-old male who's a binge drinker, has 24 hours of epigastric pain, and has a markedly elevated lipase. What's the diagnosis? Obviously, it's pancreatitis. And what is the role for imaging? So, in this particular situation, no imaging is required. So, when it comes to making the diagnosis of pancreatitis, according to the Atlanta Criteria, published most recently in 2012, you need two of the three of a typical history, elevated lipase amylase, and the imaging findings. Okay, So you have a good story for pancreatitis and an elevated amylase and lipase, you're done and you've made the diagnosis. Now, when it comes to determining the cause for the pancreatitis, in this case based on history, it's most likely alcohol and you don't need to continue with imaging. But if the cause is unknown, the other common cause of pancreatitis is obviously gallstones and in the acute setting ultrasound is the first test obviously to evaluate for gallstones and looking for a cause for the pancreatitis. So this chart here is just the appropriateness criteria for imaging in acute pancreatitis. In the first 72 hours the only really appropriate test would be abdominal ultrasound to assess for gallstones to look for a cause of the pancreatitis or for stones in the CBD. This early on, as we'll talk about in a bit, CT abdomen is not indicated. So to understand imaging in pancreatitis, it's important to understand the disease course. We can split it into the early phase, which is the first week, and the late phase, which is beyond. When it comes to the first week, management in pancreatitis is solely based on clinical factors. We call a pancreatitis a severe pancreatitis 
if there is organ failure or signs of organ failure that last greater than 48 hours. At this stage, there's no real direct correlation between the morphology on imaging and severity, and therefore, imaging doesn't really help with management. In the late phase, after a week, management is based on clinical factors and any complications. In this situation, morphology is going to help guide therapy. So with that in mind, when do we order imaging in pancreatitis? Well, we shouldn't order imaging to look for complications if the patient has a non-severe pancreatitis or is clinically improving. We should consider imaging if the patient has a severe pancreatitis, as we defined earlier, as having organ failure lasting for greater than 48 hours. And the ideal time to image is at least 72 hours from the onset of symptoms. So I'll stress that point again. There's no reason to image prior to 72 hours for complications, even in the setting of a severe pancreatitis. The main reason for imaging this early is to assess for pancreatic necrosis or any early complication. And before 72 hours, findings are nonspecific and do not change management. You can also consider imaging if the patient is over 40 years old and there's no other identifiable cause. You can do a CT to exclude pancreatic cancer as a cause. Now, if you have the time, I would encourage reading the Atlanta criteria that was updated in 2012, and it goes through this in much more detail. Okay, so case two, you have a 40-year-old female who has previous cystitis, presents with dysuria, back pain, and a fever, and has positive CVA tenderness. You're worried about pyelonephritis. Now, pyelonephritis, as you know, is a diagnosis that is usually made clinically. You should consider imaging in the setting of pyelonephritis if the patient has a history of obstruction, stones, or any other urologic surgery that complicates the picture, or if the patient has persistent symptoms after two to three days on antibiotics. Also, if the patient is diabetic, elderly, or immunocompromised, you can consider looking for complications as well. And what should you image with? Well, CT scan with contrast is the most sensitive modality. You're going to see any sort of obstruction or obstructing lesion. You're going to see any complications, things like emphysematous, pyelonephritis, abscesses, etc. Ultrasound can help uh, evaluate for more local complications. You can see if there's hydronephrosis, a local abscess, etc. MRI can be utilized if the patient is pregnant. Okay, so the take-home points from this uh, lecture. It's very important to understand the basic principles of imaging. If you understand those basic principles, everything else becomes easy in my opinion. Secondly, you need to think about what each modality shows you and choose your modalities wisely, and that's what we've been doing with the various cases that we presented today. Next, and this is very important, every time you order imaging, you need to think, how is imaging going to change management? If it's not going to change management, like in the case of an acute pancreatitis, there's no indication for imaging at that stage. I should mention that if you're debating as to what the next best test is to do, you can consult the ACR appropriateness criteria, which are also available on the website navigatingradiology.com under the Other Physicians tab. So check it out and have it handy with you so you can consult it in various clinical settings and make the right imaging choices. And lastly, and also very important, you should consult radiology. Radiologists are there in a hospital to be experts on imaging, and if you have any questions regarding anything imaging related, you should call us up. Whatever the situation might be, we can use our radiologic expertise and your clinical expertise together to come to the right decision and do great things. Okay, that's all for this talk. I'd like to thank the following people who contributed images uh, for this PowerPoint. 